Good day and welcome to everybody uh, to the first talk in uh, Nano AI and Data Science webinar series. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Leila Baga. I'm head of data science at Facebro. And uh, I will be briefly going through some housekeeping information before we get started. Uh, if you have any questions during uh, the presentation, please type them into the Zoom chat box. I will bring them up during the presentation. And we will also have uh, time for questions at the end. Uh, today, uh, we are presenting um, the impact areas uh, of machine learning in finance, banking, and insurance, presented by Dr. Hirbut Asa. Uh, also, in our talk, uh, we have uh, Dr. Yahya Tabesh, a uh, senior fellow at uh, UC Berkeley, and uh, Masud Al Rawahi, CEO of FaceRo and co founder of Face Venture Company. We would like to really thank you for joining us. And uh, with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Masud Al Rawahi. Thank you so much, Leila. Um, I don't want to talk much. I think I want to get quickly to the, the meat of the conversation. Um, but before that, just a few words. I just want to say welcome all to our inaugural uh, MENA AI and Data Science webinar. Uh, it's been a long time in the making, uh, and I'm very proud that we've kind of taken this idea and actually finally turned it into a reality. Um, just a bit of background. This actually event was kind of born out of a conversation Leila and I had um, many moons ago. Uh, we discovered that we have a wide ranging network of data science professionals and enthusiasts, uh, many of whom are crazy about the space, some even crazier than we are. We kind of thought, well, what if we connect all these dots and form a community to unlock all of this latent potential? Well, here we are, Bezro out in Moscow and UC Berkeley out in California, quite literally diametrically on opposite ends of the globe. And we're planning to connect all the dots in between with this anchor event. Uh, we highly encourage engagement, so please be prepared with all your questions at the end of the presentation. We'll be adding other facets to this community to encourage collaboration, connection, and peer learning. But for now, and without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce a colleague and dear friend, Dr. Yahya Tabash. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Masood. Thank you, Dr. Leila. Uh, on behalf of uh, Berkeley Amena Center, it is my great pleasure to be with you and supporting this event. And congratulations to you, FaceRo, and all other uh, partners of the FaceRo to supporting and starting this event. Uh, I, you know, I, I think the, in the MENA region is a talent pool, and we should bring out the opportunity for them to grow, to, to, de to develop the growth mindset that should happen when we bring opportunity and we let them to go in forward like this. At the UC Berkeley, UC Berkeley, you know, is a little bit different. They are always thinking about the impact, social impact, what they are doing. And Amina Center is uh, really in favor of supporting development and entrepreneurship and innovative thinking, innovation in the region. So th this series is just in the just in the pathway that we are following and we are supporting just a starting point and uh, thank you to all to bringing this opportunity uh, in the at Amena center i hopefully we will have more there will be more opportunities to organize training session in the advanced technologies in ai in data science project based learning these are the things that we are working on them at the uc berkeley and we can bring them all on the table bring them all to the in the region for the in the talent pool of the region, we can bring it out. And it's not going to only to be just training. You can, <clears throat> it could be a hands-on and project-based training and working on real world projects, creativity and innovation, not just training to be fun. We, we think that to the, uh, just a model of inspiration, empowering and let creativity and innovation. So now, the, you are on the first step. You are supporting these events. It's going to inspire and let them to 
learn awareness goes around and is very important for us and we fully support you on behalf of UC Berkeley Omino Center that it can happen in the region and hopefully uh, and you know the Muscat and Oman is a certain place for this kind of activities there are uh, youth there are eager to grow e eager to develop themselves eager to and there are a lot of opportunities in uh, oil and gas, renewable energy, in, I would say, logistics, in tourism. All of these should be AI enabled. There are uh, um, limitless projects we can find there. So it would be great if we can organize training, but not just training, project-based training that will go to uh, innovation. And of course, when you have innovation, entrepreneurship will happen. And, Hopefully, this is my dream and uh, our dream. I, hopefully, we all together with uh, 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 Faisal and the colleagues in the Oman, hopefully it will happen and we will have more. Again, I highly appreciate your effort in organizing this event. And <clears throat> thank you to Dr. Assad as the first speaker in the series. And hopefully it will continue. Let us keep it going forward. <laughs> don't stop, just move going forward. I am sure everything will happen. I am very optimistic. We will have very good results out of it. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so you. much, Dr. Yahya. Uh, sure, we will go ahead. Uh, great, thank you. Um, let's um, introduce our uh, dear presenter. Um, our today presenter is uh, Dr. Uh, Hirbode Asa. Uh, he's uh, an associate professor of finance and fintech and also the director of MSc Fintech at Kent Business School. He has received a PhD in fi uh, financial mathematics um, in the University of Montreal and another PhD in uh, economics uh, from uh, Concordia University. Uh, Hubot's research covers uh, topics in fintech, uh, insurtech, machine learning, and risk management. And he has published in top journals such as Economic Theory and uh, European Journal of Operation Research. Uh, Dr. Osa has been working constantly with uh, the industry and has completed projects in uh, prestigious companies, including Lloyd Bank and uh, MUFG, Mitsubishi Bank. Uh, his work with a stable group, LTD, introduced a new in, um, insure product to manage the risk of uh, commodities uh, volatile prices, was recognized by the University of Rivelfu as an impact case and has attracted in exceeding of five million dollars, uh, fifteen million dollars of investment so far. Uh, Dr. Osso was awarded the title of head of consultancy at uh, Liverpool's mathematics department in recognition of the excellent work in relation to consultancy and external engagement, and also was awarded. Uh, the Balver Singh Medal by Concordia Economic Department. Uh, now we will turn the time over to Dr. Asa. Uh, great, thank you very much for introduction. So let me just start uh, after thanking you all for um, having this nice series of events. And it's a great pleasure to be the first one presenting and uh, uh, being the first speaker uh, for uh, this initiation, uh, I see lots of opportunities here, and I hope to not sure if Facebook is institute or company, but anyhow, uh, uh, I think this, this is a good thing uh, to do, uh, especially in Middle East that need to be uh, more uh, working on, on AI and technology. So I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my screen, just uh, confirmation? Uh, yes. All right, great. Thank you very much. 
Um, again, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about how machine learning can change the financial world. Everything that you see here, uh, or I discuss later, are either directly from my own observation working with industry, or from other colleagues who are working already in industry or have been working with industry in the past few years. So for that reason, it is sort of a firsthand uh, experience uh, and the information here uh, are quite useful if you really want to work uh, with the real world. So uh, let me start with this slide. We know financial world, financial world is gigantic. We have lots of banks, insurances, hedge funds, um, central banks and any type of financial institutions, they're working together. They are uh, trading uh, shares, uh, uh, issuing insurances, issuing derivatives. They lend, they borrow, they do all sorts of activities in the financial world, which is really, really gigantic. It's a multi-trillion dollar world. Uh, but when you want to compare the Earth planet to a galaxy, then you would ask if that is really gigantic enough, the financial world. And that is uh, uh, the way that I introduce FinTech. Uh, FinTech or financial technology is the innovative use of technology in the design and delivery of financial services that can transform uh, the financial world at it exists uh, at its uh, uh, actually status uh, to one that is uh, in analogy comparable to a, a great galaxy. So uh, this is essentially what I'm going to discuss about. And I also want to start from this device because it seems that financial technology have been existing uh, for quite a while. Uh, but the, the history, or I would say the history of the revolution started with uh, smartphones and cell phones. Um, you know, smartphones are small devices that can um, actually function as your phone, your camera, uh, your booklet, uh, you can check your emails and almost everything that you need uh, over a day to, to do, you can do it now by your smartphones. So that wouldn't be a surprise then if people really expect that smartphones become their bank in, and insurances and also can give them financial advices. So this is the way that the, the, the world is changing and that I think uh, we need to emphasize more on this point. And if I want to put it in the in a historical perspective, uh, the revolution of iPhone happened at the same time of another event, but that the other event is in the financial world, and that was the financial crisis of 2008. Actually, in 2008, as you know, we had a very um, a great crisis in the finance world. On one side, in the United States, in New York, uh, people have been crying about the losses due to the financial crisis, uh, which happened uh, very severely. But on the other side of the United States in California, people like Steve Jobs were celebrating their success in introducing iPhone revolution. That is the word I want to, to put it here. So uh, this was something really uh, timely because at the time that people started to lose their uh, uh, confidence in the financial world, a world that have been introduced very much by introducing innovative financial tools like CDOs and CDSs, um, when people started to lose their confidence in them, uh, on the other hand, people started to put more confidence in technology. And that is how the world started to change. And also that was the way that the financial world started to change because then financial world also uh, realized that uh, probably they have to balance their attention, not only working with other large financial institutions, but also putting the individuals uh, means cons customers uh, in the front. Uh, and that uh, changed a lot the financial world and also the paradigm in finance, because now it's not all about the large financial institution, it is about individuals. Uh, so this has changed a lot everything. Uh, and if I want just to emphasize the main change was 
in terms of data and information, because instead of having just information from quite a few large companies, now you need to have a heterogeneous information from almost everybody all around the world, right? Just let's see what is at the stake. Uh, we know that 2 billion people uh, all around the world are unbanked. Uh, among them, 1.2 billion have access to mobile. So this is really interesting. Why? Because if we can develop a technology that can target people with mobiles, it seems that we are expanding the financial and banking world to more than one, two billion of new customers. And uh, we know only 20% of people who have mobiles have access to loans and only 50% have saving accounts. So this is a huge change, a, a huge uh, front that is opened to the, to the banking system and any other financial, uh, actually all the financial sector. So that is what I want to call it financial inclusion. That means thanks to technology, now you can have access to almost everybody all around the world and they are the new fronts for your new businesses. Uh, but this also needed to uh, be uh, actually uh, done through a change in the banking system, going from traditional banking to platform banking. And what is a platform banking? A platform banking uh, essentially has four pillars. Uh, first of all, you are collecting a larger amount of heterogeneous data from individuals in addition to extra information that you also receive from the financial uh, market that should be managed to some extent. So this uh, new information is there. Then you need uh, AI and machine learning and modeling in order to make sense of this new data. Uh, this is the second pillar, but all that can be done in a clouding and clouding computing because this is now about the scale. You want really to understand at the scale of the information that you have now, uh, how you can manage all this data and use your AI models to them. And then at the end, you also need a platform to relate all the, three, the first three pillars, right? So this is a new era where you can work with larger data, which is essentially heterogeneous, no longer homogeneous from all individuals and you need new type of modeling in order to deal with that. And this, in this talk, I'm going essentially to emphasize the role of AI, which is the subject of my talk. So that's why let me just turn to AI and machine learning. So first I have to introduce what is machine learning. Machine learning is a, an algorithm to make sense of the data, right? Uh, but um, I would say it is better explained by saying that this is where computer science and statistics meet. Uh, because uh, machine learning is statistic of many dimensions and that couldn't work without uh, computers. I mean, uh, powerful uh, computers with very high computational power. And this is the area that is happening now uh, because uh, of the big data. And that is why this is suitable for the, the big data. Let me give you an example. You want to run a linear regression. Linear regression is a simple model that almost everybody knows. Uh, but in, in a traditional way, you would just run a linear regression against quite a few independent variables. But if you want to put it in the machine learning context, it is not that you're only gonna run it against those independent variables, but also all type of polynomials of those independent variables. So it means that we are increasing the dimension of, your, of our statistic. And that is important because now we have big data and big data have a lot of new features or even more features that need to be taken care of. And that only can happen if you work with machine learning. So this is not a surprise why machine learning has become so popular at the same time uh, of, of big data. So big data is happening in, in the last few decades, right? Where we have uh, more spaces to uh, save the data and in a cheap manner, right? So that is why we have access to a lot of new data that can be analyzed. Machine learning is sort of technique that is 
uh, enabling us to deal with that. So if I want to put it in the context of a statistic or a statistical world, I would say, if the traditional statistic is just parametric uh, statistic with low dimension, uh, machine learning is the statistic that is uh, moving towards infinite dimension, and I would just call it a mini dimension. Uh, so that is why essentially what is important in machine learning and AI world is dimension. You have to make decision about the dimension that we call it model complexity and um, not very much how you estimate them. What you really want to know is to forecast everything uh, in this world. I also want to share uh, another perspective uh, from Professor Agrawal from University of Toronto and his co-authors in, in this nice book, which is called Prediction Machine about AI. Actually, in their book, they say every job can be, I mean, AI job can be divided uh, to a smaller tasks. And this a smaller task follow this diagram. Uh, when you want to do a task, you need some data, which is the input in, into your system. And then you have a modeling part that makes you able to uh, do a judgment, right? And after that judgment, you take an action. And after the action, you see the outcome and you need then to feed back this, uh, to feed back this to your system to see how well your model is working. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, you go to your doctor, uh, probably you have a problem in your knee, right? So the information that you feed to your doctor is the problem about your knee. And the doctor is like the modeling part and uh, he or she is going to decide uh, after doing the judgment, whether you need to do some sort of, for example, MRI or not and take an action. And after a few weeks, the doctor is checking with you whether the recommendation that the doctor has made uh, has improved your condition or not. And then the information is fed back uh, to some extent to the doctor to see whether that is working. But this is really important from one particular perspective, because AI is something that makes modeling cheaper. Now, thanks to AI and machine learning, you have access to a lot of, uh, a, a variety, I would say, of different models, right? And that is why modeling is no longer a, a a, an art that is just owned by a very few people. Almost everybody has access to different models, right? So, but that is important because the other bits are like complementary goods to modeling. And we know that if the price of something in a system goes down, the, uh, the price of the complementary goods go, go up. Uh, for example, if you uh, drink tea, you know that with tea, you also need to consume sugar. But if for whatever reason tea becomes cheaper uh, and you have access to more tea and consume more tea, you also need to consume more sugar which increases the demand for sugar and put the prices for sugar higher because it is now in higher demand. So you see when you have higher demand in one complementary good, the other complementary goods prices are actually gonna increase if you have a lower price for that one. And this is what's, what is going to happen for modeling. Sorry, uh, wrong direction. And modeling now is cheaper. So that is why now we have higher price for other parts. We have higher price for data. And that is why data now is called the new oil. We have higher price for action. We have higher price for judgment. So that means that using AI doesn't mean that we are removing everything. AI is not taking care of everything. AI, uh, when comes at play, then judgment becomes important. Action becomes important. The learning becomes important. And more importantly, data becomes more important. So now let me talk a little bit about the impact on finance. Uh, according to my experience and uh, other friends that I have talked to, uh, I categorize the areas of impact to three. Uh, the first area is the illusion that we have from the impact, uh, which is happening, I think, in all areas of AI, uh, because there are things that people are think, are think that uh, they are really helpful, but they are not. This is very much happening in the literature. Myself or, or my other academic colleagues probably are developing 
in that direction. So we have to be very careful not to add to the illusion. I would also say that this was something that I also observed in some companies and banks in Toronto. They invested a lot in past few years um, in AI to be applied to finance. But after a few years, they really understood that their investment was not a good investment. So that is why we need to be very careful about uh, the areas that are elusive and be taken as a uh, real impact, whereas they are not. The other category is part of evolution. That means we are expecting to see some uh, great progresses and they are happening thanks to AI. Let me give you an example. Uh, as a quant in a bank, you usually need to solve uh, something that we call it partial differential equations. Partial differential equations are very important because they give us understanding about the prices of derivatives. There are lots of numerical methods to solve uh, these partial differential equations numerically, but they are not good for high dimensions. Essentially, when you have a large portfolio, then you need to deal with a high dimension uh, partial differential equations. Uh, but thanks to AI and particularly uh, artificial neural network, these days things are changing. That means we are now uh, able to solve high dimensional partial differential equation for larger portfolios uh, uh, much better than before. So this is part of evolution that we expect that it is not a revolutionary thing, but it's a, it's a very important evolution. We also have more accurate classification methods for credit risk for demand analysis. And some examples I'm going to give you uh, in this talk. And finally, we also have a revolutionary part, which are really important. For example, in terms of customer service, uh, AI had made a, a real change. Now NLP, natural language processing and face recognition, voice recognition, they are readily being used uh, in, in banking system and insurance and all fi financial institutions are benefiting from them. We also have sentiment analysis that di didn't exist uh, before, right? Um, more importantly, I would mention DeFi and DEIN, that means decentralized finance and decentralized insurance. This is an area of great impact, I would say, and it is really a, a revolution because thanks to AI now, we have access to much more data and we can uh, expand the, uh, the boundary of banking and insurance to all individuals and not only uh, large companies. We also have a revolution in robo-advisory. Actually, in 2017, uh, the robo-advisor, I mean the robo-financial advisor, could outperform the real advisor. And that is an area that is really important because advisors are really, really expensive. And if you can just have a good AI robo-advisor, that would change the world of advisory, financial advisory. But now let me give you some, a few examples, probably just two, uh, from the second one, that means the evolutionary part, uh, to give you some sort of idea what really is happening. And both uh, examples are from my own experience. The first one is from a banking uh, application and the problem of CDS proxies. Uh, CDS is a financial tool that, tool that is, to some extent, betting against the well-being of a company. So that means if a company has a CTS associated with, with that, with, uh, with the company, then uh, the prices move uh, a, uh, in a reverse direction uh, than the company's uh, health. Uh, I mean, if the company well-being is good, I, it's, a, it's in a good, good condition, then the prices of CDS go down. And if the, uh, actually the situation of the, the company is uh, deteriorating, uh, then the prices of CTS go up. This is really important tool because it can be used in the assessment of the credit risk of the companies. So uh, it is not true that all companies have CDS. Uh, I would say among 10,000 companies that we studied, only 1,500 or 2,000 only have CDSs. For that reason, for the, uh, uh, for the remaining, we need something which we call it CDS proxy. That means 
uh, if we had a CDS for all those remaining companies, what would be the, the CDS, right? Um, we call it CDS proxy. So um, CDS usually is determined according to quite a few uh, data entry, which are the region sector average rating, and also you can include equity, return, and volatility. For example, uh, we can have a company in Asia, which is in energy sector and has a very good rating AAA. This is how you understand the companies and give their CDSs according to these uh, specifications, right? Uh, the method that is used in industry in order to give CDS proxy to companies who don't have CDS is exactly like this. You will see in which region, in each, which sector, and in, in which rating the company belongs to, and you call, it, call that a bucket, and then find all companies with CDS in the same bucket and associate the average CDS rate of those companies to, to your company of interest at the CDS, uh, as the CDS proxy. This is the way that is done uh, in the industry. So it is like a, like a tree. That means uh, if you are familiar with AI and machine learning, you know that this is very much a, a tree method. So this is not very advanced method, uh, even though it is used in industry, but you can imagine that sometimes the buckets are empty or there are very few uh, members in a bucket that cannot give you very good um, approximation of the P uh, CDS proxy. Uh, there are other methods to improve that. For example, there are classifications and regressions, but in the project that I have done for a large bank in here in, in, in London, I propose to use uh, neural networks because I have seen the nonlinearity of the model. And then we decided with one of my undergraduate students to set up a neural network in order to uh, to approximate the CDS proxy. proxy. How uh, we decided to train the model with the companies who have already a CDS and then use that in order to come up with the CDS proxy for other companies who don't have CDS. And that worked very well here. I'm just presenting you the learning curves. And that is an example how you can just very simply, very simply use AI to improve an important banking task uh, in the real world. Here, I just give you a very simple example because I want to show how we are expecting the, the knowledge to evolve in that area. I also have an example from insurance. Um, from the demand analysis side, because it was an insurance company who wanted really to know who are, what are the characteristics of the uh, loyal um, clients and what are the characteristics of the clients who are prone to leave. This is really important because you can then add to the prices of the loyal customers because they're not going to leave and you can then give some discount to ones that are prone to leave in order to motivate them not to leave. Uh, this also was done uh, uh, actually easily by running some classification methods uh, within a pool of different uh, models. And if you're familiar with these graphs, you know that these are ROC curves and among them you would find the one that gives you the better, the best estimation. And you know, uh, when you do this, this is not the end of the story because then I have to identify those prone to leave and also the lawyer customers. For that, we needed then to run some lift charts and gain charts in order to identify those customers. And interestingly, this analysis is improving 10% of the income uh, um, very easily. At least this happened for that company. So these are type of examples that uh, says how uh, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, evolutionary perspective, you can change the finance and insurance world, not with a great effort, but with a smart effort. The final uh, subject that I also want to cover in this uh, talk is about interpretability, because in finance world, what is really important is regulator, and regulator is very much obsessed about interpretation. It is not that you only want to run things inside your company, you also need to explain them to, to the regulator, and this is heavily uh, actually uh, uh, overshadowing uh, the, the application 
of AI uh, in, in finance. This is really, really important thing in, in finance world. Uh, this is a topic that people now are working a lot on that. Uh, there are a few answers to that. First of all, there are quite a few methods uh, that by nature are interpretable. For example, if you know the trees, uh, uh, trees uh, are good examples or regressions are a, a good examples of methods that by nature are interpretable. Or you have two type of other model agnostic uh, ways of interpreting data. The first one is lo local um, uh, interpretable model agnostic explanation. And the other one is a Shapley value, which is an, an idea that is coming from the game theory. If I want just to explain it, let's say uh, you have a sort of data that you run a classification using a three methods. Uh, if you go for a shallow tree, that means the first uh, few layers, uh, then you can start uh, tracing back your decision in a tree and say, what was the reason that you have come up with the decision to classify something in class A or B? So this is something that we know by nature ha has a way to interpret. But the other one is local model agnostic interpreter. How this works, uh, this is not really difficult. It's very much like uh, when you go to a doctor. Uh, um, this, is, this is a good example that can explain it to you. Uh, when you go to a doctor, for example, the doctor gonna di diagnose you with, with, uh, with something. They say, if you are ill or not, the doctor is like a classifier. Uh, but when you ask the doctor, what was the reason? And the doctor start explain to you that for example, in your age, with your blood pressure and with your sugar pressure and other conditions that you have, you are diagnosed with this illness, for example. So this is very much a local way of interpreting. That means the machine learning, which, is, which here is the doctor, is not going to reveal you the, the, uh, the general rule that uh, is diagnosed uh, that 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 diagnosed that you with the illness, but is going to explain you very locally, according to similar people to you. That means similar people in terms of age, blood pressure, and sugar, uh, blood sugar, um, to explain you why you are diagnosed with this type of illness. So this is the local interpretation. Way. But you also have some sort of thing that is more global and is using Shapley value idea. Shapley uh, actually is the name of an economist, uh, famous game theorist uh, that introduced a way to allocate uh, values to different features of uh, something. And we know that when we are running a machine learning or AI method, and we are dealing with features, right? So that means the features of the object that you're studying. And because Shabli has introduced many years ago, one way to allocate values to the features, not in machine learning, but in game theories, that was very much known as a good method uh, of allocating values to different uh, features. This is now very heavily used uh, in machine learning, and this gives you some sort of uh, global understanding of the importance of, uh, of the features in a model that is used now in the banks and other institutions in order to interpret the, uh, the machine learning method. So now let me just conclude. Uh, in this talk, uh, I just discussed the important uh, impact of machine learning and AI in the financial world. I said that part of that is a revolution, uh, which is really important. Part of that is, is evolution, uh, but small part of that, which is also really important, is just an illusion that we have. And we have to be very careful about the illusions. And over the years, we will hear more about those elusive parts because now banks have realized what parts are more useful and what parts are not. And also I discussed that machine learning is becoming more and more interpretable thanks to the new research that we see over the past few years. And that would help the regulator to better understand um, the application of machine learning in the financial world 
which is really important. Okay, thank you very much. This is the end of my talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Asa. Uh, we will go ahead and take some time for question now. Uh, I didn't receive any question in chat box, uh, but uh, if uh, you have any question, uh, please um, ask. Um, Can I ask a question? Uh, sure. Hi. Hi, Professor. Hi, Hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice presentation. I have only one question and it's regarding the AI because you explained about the AI and how it affects in uh, industry and firms. And my question is how uh, AI can um, protect the fraud um, uh, fraud preventions. I mean, how can, how can they prevent from the fraud if something like that is happening? And second, um, does AI help uh, to uh, protect the digital right of information in the system? Because I'm working on digital right. And the only thing that we really could not identify yet is that even though um, information are protected through systems and softwares, but still AI can um, act as a trigger and maybe change everything. And uh, I would wonder how can we prevent that? So two questions at once. Okay. You, you Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you very much for uh, those questions. Uh, actually, the first one is a really important question because uh, a fraud detection is a great area of impact from machine learning. And this is happening, uh, I would categorize it as the evolutionary part, not the revolutionary part. It's not, it, it hasn't revolutionized the methods that we already have for fraud detection, but this is becoming really important. And now banks are very much investing in that. Um, uh, for example, I know JP Morgan, which is one of the largest banks in the world. Now they are running a, a, a big unit on you using machine learning for fraud detection. I think this is a very, very uh, sensitive area because it very much also depends on the company's reputation, right? So you can't ruin the company's reputation, but just running uh, a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, fraud alerts, right? So you have to be very much careful about the level of, of the fraud that you really want to detect. And so that is why even though now companies are running as actually very advanced algorithms uh, to detect the frauds, they are still to some extent checked by humans. Uh, because at the end of the day, what is at the stake is the, the, the company's reputation. Um, this is now very much happening, at least in UK, I can say that when you want to transfer money to uh, quite a few of digital banks, unfortunately, always you get some sort of uh, fraud alerts. Uh, so we really don't know if this is an algorithm, this is an algorithm that gives you the alert, or if this is, a, a, I don't know, a set of rules that companies has come up to, have come up to, but still it seems that it is a, a great area of impact. The second one is about digital protection. Am I, digital am I right? rights. Dig digital rights. So I'm not very much familiar with that topic. Can you explain a little bit more? Yes. Uh, digital right management is a system that is protecting the information, uh, but particularly the information that is directly come from the owner of the information. So the problem would be that in the system and when you are dealing with the customers, especially with customers, you might get information from third parties or from from someone who does not have the ownership of the information that would cost a problem for, uh, especially for banking 
system because they do not have officially legitimate uh, information. They do not have the permission to use the information because they might not have the DRM, digital right uh, management. And that's the problem that right now we are discussing at, in our university that uh, AI, uh, besides all the positivity of the AI and everything good about AI, um, it's opposite on regards of DRM, meaning that uh, people can access to the information without the permission and with the help of AI. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem on AI and we are looking to find a way to solve this problem. I don't know if we can in finance, we are talking general uh, in finance, but I'm talking about especially in m and we are finding um, a way to uh, find a solution between acquire and target, uh, all I mean. That's the DRM. Yes, that can be a really interesting area, uh, uh, of course. Uh, I don't have expertise on that, but I can imagine uh, if a problem is caused by AI, uh, to some extent probably can be also solved by AI. But these are heavily regulated uh, topics, right? So this means essentially that AI is not giving you the ultimate answer. Everything should be revised by the regulators, right? And uh, this is an area that we very much want to avoid uh, because it is very much far from the technicalities that we really much know. A uh, regulator needs to really decide about that. But I can imagine regulators can benefit from AI to solve a problem that is caused by AI. Exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Uh, Homayun, uh, please ask your question. Hello, uh, Professor, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is Said, and I'm working with the University of Yavle in Sweden. I'm working with accounting and finance. I have one question regarding to the proud prevention and continuous auditing. How I would like to know about uh, uh, the digital technology and AI and how, how is the trend of real-time technology and AI for prevention of fraud? Because as, uh, as we know that most of the decision maker, they are using the data, for example, after one week or two weeks in order to make prevention of fraud. But is it any technology that we could test it, the real time technology in order to prevent of fraud or not? I will be appreciated if you just let me know how is the trend of technology in that regard. Yes, this is a question that is really difficult to answer because I am, at least from my experience, uh, banks really don't share the technologies that you use. Uh, overall, I can say that this is uh, some sort of classification method that you have to use in real time, right? Probably we are developing something in academia, but it's really difficult to understand what uh, people in bank really are doing. At least uh, from a friend of mine who is now uh, working in, in JP Morgan as a vice president uh, in the fraud section, understand that they don't reveal these things. Even as the closest friend, they don't, my friend never told me what are the algorithms that they use, right? So for that reason, we can't just speculate about what they are doing in the banks. So uh, from my understanding is they just want to have good classifier. The most important question for them is not how good the classifier is, is how much this classifier can uh, take care of many different aspects in relation to the bank reputation and also the bank business. Because as they say, it is like fixing a car while you're driving, right? So this is really important that you, uh, as long as uh, you are driving a car, you want also to fix it. So you cannot, and really stop it, right? So from that perspective, uh, I can say that uh, the question is not about the technology. The question is about how much they want to push for either direction, right? So that means being very sensitive or being very uh, 
uh, accurate about, about uh, fraud detection. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Um, any other questions? Can I have a question? Please sure. go ahead, please. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Assad. It was really fantastic. You did a very good presentation and I really enjoyed and it was very, I think, informative for all of us. My question is, uh, I am not so good in the finance and market and things like this. I have a question about these Robinhood applications. What do you think? Is it going to uh, fundamentally change many things in, say, I would say, stocks and those things? Like, I don't know. What do you think about these things? How AI can affect them? And when they have access to more data, they can have uh, just uh, analyzes much better and bring out the more information to the public. And how, to, uh, what do you think about this kind of things, this approach about the Robin Hood type approach in the finance and in the market? Uh, yes, that is really important. The thing is many things are happening at the same time, but that, that doesn't mean that they are all AI. Uh, for example, you can just come up with a platform, uh, for example, like eToro or, or other platforms that you are following other traders or let's say other successful traders, right? Or you can have some uh, new technology with, where you call it, uh, when you call uh, that you want to call it blockchain and then cryptocurrencies. So these are new things happening at the same time, but they are not necessarily AI, right? So I think if you really want to understand what AI is doing, is that how AI can help us to understand if they are doing well or not, right? Or maybe in future AI can be uh, readily used in their platforms. But uh, my understanding is that not everything that is happening today in terms of technology is AI. They can be other things, right? For example, blockchain is not AI. As far as I understand, blockchain is a new way of formalizing um, uh, your uh, formulating uh, money, right? For example, say, how we can decentralize money, right? But this is not AI, this is a different thing, right? Maybe you, you can use AI in order to, to mine uh, cryptocurrency, but cryptocurrency on its own is not AI. So for that reason, my understanding is if we want to really see what the impact of AI is, we have to look at the trends and those are gonna be the, the areas of impact as, as we discussed. Because, for example, um, um, decentralized finance uh, or uh, um, the usage of uh, NLP, natural language processing, uh, these are the areas that are changing a lot uh, the financial world. And we are also seeing a lot of good progress, which I call it evolution, in terms of uh, the technicalities that we use, for example, in the quant world. Uh, we have a lot of new progress in terms of uh, coming up with, with better numerical methods, uh, have better classifications. All those type of things uh, are the trends. And the other things to me is not, a, 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 uh, they are not something that I really want to, to call them as a trend. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It looks like we've uh, covered all the question. Uh, Dr. Rosa, is there anything else you wanted to cover before wrap up? Uh, I just want to thank you uh, for the invitation. I think this is a great initiation and I hope to be a part of it in future. Uh, so I'm happy that this is happening in MENA area, uh, Middle East and North Africa. Because I'm originally also from uh, Middle East, uh, I'm really happy to uh, actually to be involved and see this the progress that is made uh, in this area. Uh, just that. Thank you very much again. Uh, thank you so much uh, from you. We really appreciate it for your presentation. Uh, 
Uh, great. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Uh, please join our next webinar of Meno AI and Data Science uh, webinar series. Um, and uh, thank you again for joining us today. We will see you next time. In meanwhile, we would like to invite you uh, to our Slack work space. We will send um, the invitation to our Slack work space uh, via uh, the email that you have registered for the webinar. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very us. much. Thank you very much.